And by the way, for those who don't know, there's clover in the fields, the wild fields in the countryside of St. Anne, and there are pine trees in the, the mountain, right? Now, when I heard it first, I said, oh, where is that? Yes, it's all here. Everything is here. So now, to share with us his wisdom, his warmth, his healing energy, and his love is our pastor, whose mentor is John the Beloved. And he is well deserving of that name. So let us show him some love and welcome him as he would share his love with us. Show me more love than that, man. Show me. Oh, family, it's so wonderful to see you. And did you see Stevie Golden wandering around? I think he, I think he went to the, um, the, t the teenagers where his heart is and found him age paper. Welcome, Stevie. Welcome home. Let us give it to him together. Welcome, Stevie. Welcome home. And welcome to you all to this wonderful Sunday morning celebration and to those that join us in consciousness and watch us on YouTube and on the World Wide Web. How many of you are lovers of auctions? How many of you have been to auctions? I have an auction, auction story for you. Going once, going twice. Sold to the gentleman in the green shirt at the back of the room. One by one, all the antiques on auction were offered for sale. And finally, the auctioneer looked around. Nothing was left. So he smiled, that professional auctioneer smiled at nothing. Do you ever see, see them on um, public television? Sometimes they have antiques road show, and they, the experts say, have you any idea what this is worth? And people say, oh my goodness, I have no idea. I, I, I must treat it with more respect. Well, the auctioneer looked at my friend, and he said, and what am I doing for this fine woman in the front? And then she woke up. Thank God, it was only a dream and she didn't have to wait to hear what other people thought she was worth. Anyway, many of us based our ideas of what we think we are worth and how much we matter to life by other people's opinions of us, don't? Too often. Too often we think if someone admires us or, or as we say in Jamaica, bigs us up, we feel worthwhile. And then if people disapprove of us, we think, hmm, not, me not say nothing. I wonder if we should have observed this rock for church this morning. Nobody has admired it. So we base our, our self-worth too often on what other people think. But really and truly, my message this morning to you is, you matter. You really matter to life. And I have set my intention, my friends, that no one shall leave my presence without feeling really worthwhile and that they matter. So please say to your neighbor, you matter. You matter to God and you matter to life. Namaste. You matter. You matter to God and you matter to life. Namaste. You matter. You matter to God and you matter to life. Namaste. You matter to God and you matter to life. One of our centers of spiritual living ministers shared this story which really opened my heart. It's titled, Mama's Gift, and is written by Wendy Burt, uh, an African-American freelance writer from Colorado Springs in the USA, and I wanted to share it with you. It really touched me. She writes, the first time I saw a white man, I was sitting in church. It was the middle of August, and the humidity hovered in our Alabama parish like grits in a cast iron kettle. I sat quietly 
He wedged between Mama and Aunt Fanny, catching bits of bruises as they fanned themselves with their hard straw fans. The Reverend rambled on, his fire and brimstone sermon seasoned with occasional hallelujah and praise the Lord from the sweaty congregation. I stared out the church window and wandered into a daydream, picturing the Sunday dinner we would have later that day. A Sunday feast was typical for all the families, and I reckoned it was God's reward to us for sitting through two hours of preaching. But that one summer Sunday, everything changed for me. In the middle of his Bible-thumping, clenched fist exuberance, the reverend stopped. The silence caught me by surprise. And at first, I thought maybe he knew I wasn't listening, as if God had allowed him to read my mind. I looked at the pulpit to see him standing there with an expression of disgust, staring at the back of the church as if the devil himself had just entered. With the rest of the congregation, I turned to see the interruption. There, leaning against the front doors of our church, or a pure black church, was a drifter, a skinny, disheveled, white drifter. This man, this invader of our sacred space, stood before us in all his unholiness. His ragged clothes seemed to hang on him, and his face looked pasty and sunken like a man waiting for death. Worst of all, he had entered our church barefoot, his blistered, bloody feet staining our holy wood floor. We were still. He walked down the center aisle with slow, deliberate steps. His legs looked fragile and weak, and his hunched back made him look as though he carried the world on his shoulders. Pardon me, Reverend, he said, as he removed his hat and seated himself in the front pew. The Reverend looked around the congregation and then at Mr. Jackson, our layman, who barely acknowledged the man before turning away. Looking down at the bloody floor, the Reverend shook his head. He glanced at the drifter for just a second and with a roll of his eyes, picked up where he left off. The man glanced at the stained floor and bowed his head, ashamed. I couldn't take my eyes off him. His skin seemed to drip off him like wet laundry. I was confused by the reverend's reaction. I had never really listened to any of the Sunday sermons, but the bits and pieces I had picked up had taught me that God wanted us to be kind to others. And yet here, in the place that the reverend called God's house, I was witness to a stranger in need being passed over. <coughs> then to my right, Mama Rose. Clutching her good Sunday kerchief, she walked straight to the church's christening bowl. The reverend stopped speaking. Taking the pitcher of water, that the Reverend himself had been drinking from during the sermon, she stepped down to the front pew. Be not ashamed, my brother, said Mama, kneeling in front of the man. I leaned forward and watched as she filled the christening bowl with water and then dunking her kerchief, she bathed the man's feet. I could see the man's face as he began to cry. Engrossed in the miracle that I had just witnessed, I had forgotten about dinner by the time Mama returned to her seat. I had seen Mama through different eyes that day. Like Rosa Parks, who walked to the front of the bus, Mama had challenged the racism that surrounded her. Like Susan B. Anthony, taking charge when it was necessary, Mama had showed me the strength of a woman's actions. And like the good Samaritan helping a stranger in need, Mama had gone to the aid of another 
in need of kindness. That hot Alabama Sunday, Mama showed me not only who she was, but who I was. In one day, she set a lifelong example, paving a road for her only daughter to walk down proudly as an African-American, as a woman, as a Christian. I want to thank Wendy Burt, wherever she may be, for that very powerful story. It just opened my heart and moved me to tears. You know, friends, the late Mother Teresa is quoted as saying, and I, I quote, we ourselves feel that we are doing, that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean. But if that drop was not in the ocean, I think the ocean would be less because of the missing drop. You are a drop in the ocean of life. And in that drop are all the qualities inherent in the larger ocean. Isn't that just an amazing thought to have? That in you, in me, in every single person, regardless of race or creed or politics or sexual preference or now gender has become very fluid. It's not just male and female anymore. There's a whole range of gender fluidity. But regardless, each of us is a drop of that divine, that special something that created all things out of itself. Since it forms beyond the basic human needs of food and shelter and clothing and sex, our greatest need is to know that we really do matter to life. And too many of us labor under the mis misconception, I would call it, that if we can accumulate enough stuff and have enough money and live in the right place and drive the right car and know the right people, that we matter. But the truth is, we fail to realize that the only way to attain the feeling of being valid and valuable to life is to know beyond a doubt that we matter simply because we exist and that we have been created by something so wonderful and so awesome and so unbelievably beautiful that each of us must come to that recognition of who and what we are, who we really are. I'd like to do a brief exercise in what I call self-reflection. And so to begin, if it is comfortable for you, I'd like you to just gently close your eyes, uncross your legs, and for a few moments, simply observe your breathing. Just observe your breath without manipulating it. Notice how it goes in cool and comes out warm. And if your mind gets distracted to the Sunday dinner, perhaps, just gently bring your awareness back to your breathing. Just your breathing. Now bring your awareness into the area of your heart. Not the center of your chest, a little to the left. See if you can keep your awareness in the area of your heart for the next few minutes as I pose four questions to you. The first question. Mentally ask yourself, who am I? Who am I? Allow any images, sensations, feelings, or thoughts to spontaneously come to you. Who am I?
Now ask yourself the second question. What do I want? What do I really want? And again allow any images, sensations, feelings or thoughts to spontaneously come to you. What do I want? And now the third question, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? Again, allowing images, sensations, feelings or thoughts to come to you spontaneously. And now the fourth question. What am I grateful for? What am I grateful for? Right here, right where I am in life. What am I grateful for? Just let it come to you spontaneously. Now to close off the self-reflection exercise, I want you to simply say, I am, and use your two, your two names. I would say, I am John Scott. You would say, I am, whatever your two names are. Just say it a couple of times. I am your full name. Now let go of your last name and say just your first name. I am John. So it's a few times. And now drop your first name and simply say, I am. I am. I am. In the Sanskrit, I am becomes aham, 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 which is the sound of the breath. Aham, aham, aham. With your eyes still closed, bring your awareness back to your body. Become aware again of your breathing and take a minute or two before gently, ever so slowly, opening your eyes and being fully present right here, right now.
gently come back to the present moment. My friends, no matter what circumstances you face, no matter how you feel at any given time, no matter what life appears, appearances may be, you are one with all the power of the universe and therefore always capable. This oneness, this truth of who you are cannot be won or lost, it cannot be bought or sold, nor is it a gift that God has bestowed on some to the exclusion of others. It can't be had because you belong to one church, one race, or one creed. As Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, put it, spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. Spirit put the individuality of itself upon itself and called it you. Let us affirm this using the third person. Say, spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it, and call your first name. Together, spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it John. Now to your neighbor say, spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. Namaste. Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. Namaste. Let us say, Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon Jamaica, upon itself, and called it Jamaica. Let's say that together. Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it Jamaica. This brings me to your assignment. You know, there's been a lot of talk. I've had a, a lot of WhatsApp messages and emails about the proposed mining of the cockpit country. Then what they did. But you may have been asked to sign a petition or to stop, it, to stop it. And you may or may not have signed it. But I want us, as our assignment this week, to declare the entire island a zoo a zone of spiritual operation. I want us to know in our consciousness in our prayer work and our spiritual exercises this week, that Jamaica is a zoso, a zone of spiritual operation. And that in that zone, everything is returned to God's pristine beauty and perfection. And if you don't live in Jamaica, know that zoso, that zone of spiritual operation for where you live, for your community. And we can also know for the islands of the Caribbean that have been touched by the weather systems. We can know for places that have been ravaged by forest fires or earthquakes. You can declare a zoso for all of God's creation because all of God's creation is filled with the glory and the consciousness and the knowingness that God is at the center and the circumference of all that is. The stamp of individuality, my friends, includes the incredible ability bestowed by God on each one of us to determine our experience of life by means of our thought. So our conscious mind dictates to the subconscious, some, uh, Ernest Holmes sometimes called it the subjective mind because it is subject to the dictates of the conscious mind. We can dictate to that subconscious the truth of what we want to experience. And what we do consistently as a practice in terms of keeping our consciousness focused on something tends to come into our experience, yes? Everybody is, is with me on that. So we need to watch our thoughts. And so, you know, I appreciate when people out of the kindness of their heart sent me things that warn me of whatever the, the latest danger is and the latest scam. But guess what happened? 
I keep my mind focused on what I want to experience. And I want to keep myself absolutely sure of the pristine beauty and perfection, the original perfection. The fundamentalist talks in terms of orig original sin, but Warren Elmer taught me about the original perfection, which is the blueprint at the center of everybody and everything. And I want to keep myself focused on that original perfection so that I can call it forth whenever I am faced by a challenge. That may be a challenge in relationships, it may be a health challenge, it may be a financial challenge, it may be another friend's journey that I am helping them with. I need to keep my mind focused on the truth of perfect God, perfect person, perfect expression. And so I want to close with a, a wonderful teaching story um, that I've shown you before, but like all teaching stories, it's really worth repeating. I read it in Joan Barry Fenker's book, Seven Paths to God, but she got it from Father Anthony Dumelo, a, a Catholic mystic who wrote a book called Taking Flight. And it's a story of a, a monastery in the hills somewhere in Europe. And it was decaying and crumbling and with just a few grumpy old monks who, who were dissatisfied with everything. And the congregation had dwindled till there were, there were very few people coming to Mass on a Sunday. And no new young men had been applying for years to enter um, the, you know, to, to the postulants and to become to become monks. And so the abbot really was very concerned about this. And he had a, a, a school friend, a, chi a childhood friend, um, who, was a, who had become a rabbi. And so he went to see his friend, the rabbi, and they sat sipping tea together uh, one afternoon as the abbot poured out his, his anguish about this, this failing monastery and the, the grumpiness of the monks and the the terrible decline that the monastery was facing. And the rabbi just sat sipping his tea and smiling over the rim of his teacup at his friend. And when he had, the abbot had finished pouring out his heart, the rabbi said to him, but surely you know that one of you is the Messiah. What? One of us, the Messiah? No, <laughs> we are simple men, you know, from the around the origins. They, no, no, impossible. And the rabbi took a last sip of his tea and said, my friend, as you know, God works in mysterious ways. God works in mysterious ways. And so all the way back to the monastery, the abbot turned over the thought, the wild possibility that perhaps one of that very ragged and threadbare set of monks might be the Messiah. Who on earth could it possibly be? Surely not Brother Paul the slubbing the cook. But why not? Doesn't God delight in nourishing his children? <laughs> no, absolutely not, Brother Raymond, the silly joker. He's always making an ass of himself. But didn't God, Jesus, say that unless we become as little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven? Oh, I wonder. What about Brother Michael, the silent and taciturn gardener? Oh, could it be that he's not really taciturn, that he's in deep communion with nature? Like St. Francis, who communed with the animals and the, and the plants, after whom our own order is, is named? the Order of St. Francis. And so next morning after morning prayers, the abbot called a meeting of the monks and announced that he had shocking news. One of them was the Messiah. A new idea. The news jolted everyone, and they began to regard each other with new eyes and new respect. Every word and action was interpreted as a gift from God. An abundance of love began to pour from the monks through their hearts and their eyes and nourished everything they looked upon. And you know what happened? The gardens began to flourish. And the food became delicious. And people began to show up somehow at Sunday Mass again. And before long, young men began to apply for admission to the order.
What do you think happened? What, what do you think changed? Consciousness. Consciousness. You know, Dr. Linda, um, speaking about this in, in the power of intention, says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so you don't have to change every thought, every word, every feeling. It's those that you concentrate on, those that you keep your attention focused on. Dr. David J. Walker, uh, uh, in a wonderful book titled You Are Enough, writes, and I quote, the real self is God. When we identify ourselves in this way, we cannot help but meet the world with a confidence that allows us to deal effectively with the changing panorama of life's experiences. Throughout the Caribbean and in other parts of the world, people are dealing with the panorama of the changing experience of their lives and the landscapes that which, uh, with which they were so familiar. Can we keep our consciousness focused on the truth that right there, right where they are, right where we are, God is? That is the, what I want us to really contemplate this week and to take away. But the truth is, my friends, Spirit put the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. One of you? Nay, all of you are the Messiah. Namaste.